Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Stephanie Jones. I'm the event manager at Drug Policy Alliance, and I also have the privilege of being the moderator for this session, What Can Psychedelics Teach Us About Drug Misuse and Addiction? So um, I'm not going to say a lot of comments. I'm going to let these fine, intelligent people do most of the talking on this session. Um, but I will say, when we were um, discussing the conference program, this was one of the top issues that we wanted to address relating to psychedelics. The fact, you know, it seems kind of counterintuitive that you could use a drug to treat another drug addiction, or, or that seems kind of something crazy, but we've seen, in fact, in the history that psychedelics can be very useful in terms of treating drug addiction, different kinds of different of addiction, different um, drug addiction. So I'm going to let these uh, people tell you about the work they've been doing in that area, and even how psychedelics can be used outside of clinical and research settings relating to drug misuse and addiction. So our first speaker is Albert Garcia Romeo. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. um, he's a research fellow at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and he has been um, studying the use of psychedelics for treatment of addiction um, in smoking. So, please welcome Albert. Uh, hello, and thank you all for coming out here. We appreciate the fact that there is some public interest and support for the work that uh, everybody in here is doing or interested in on some level. Um, I am going to be talking uh, specifically about uh, a project that I've been working on, but uh, I also want to talk a little bit more generally about uh, research in the laboratory where I work, which is uh, uh, a laboratory uh, under the um, auspices of Lola Griffiths, who's a senior researcher there, and Matt Johnson and uh, Catherine McLean, who are uh, some other researchers that I've had the pleasure of working with at Hopkins for the last you know, 16 months or year and a half or so since I've been on there. And um, what they've been doing is really innovative um, because a lot of these drugs that are called quote unquote psychedelics, and that's not a very good term because it, even though it was coined by Humphrey Osmond um, back in the late 50s, I believe, to denote these kinds of mind manifesting drugs, it's not really <clears throat> a good catch all because. Uh, some of I've heard some of the other researchers and uh, presenters up here talking about. Um, if you're talking about MDMA, it works one way. If you're talking about psilocybin or LSD, it works in another way. Um, all these drugs work quite differently in the brain, and they look different in terms of their pharmacological profiles and what are their effects and so forth. And so the uh, researchers at Hopkins um, got interested in some of these drugs, and some of them that are more esoteric, like uh, DXM or dextromethorphan. Um, Salvia divinorum, uh, which is another one of these quote unquote um, psychedelic or hallucinogenic compounds. And <clears throat> the thing is, there's a lot that we don't know about these drugs. And um, so, you know, over the last uh, 10 to 12 years or so, uh, researchers at Hopkins have been trying to find out more about you know, what, what do they do, how do they work, and what are their potentials, um, not just for harm, because I think a lot of the research in general tends to be biased towards what are the harms of these substances, but um, what are the potentials that we can use them in a medicinal way? And um, as you know, Stephanie was saying, um, there <clears throat> it might sound crazy to use a drug to treat a drug addiction, for instance. However, it's not really, because um, right now I'm studying smoking addiction, and if you are a smoker trying to kick the habit, you're going to often be uh, prescribed by your physician so a drug like Shantix, which is made by Pfizer, which makes hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars a year for that um, pharmaceutical corporation. Uh, a drug like uh, Zyban, which is also um, well, butrin, uh, an antidepressant, and um, that's also <coughs> often prescribed as a medication or drug to treat a drug habit. And so it's, it's fairly common, as a matter of fact. And so if you're looking at uh, treatment of opioid abuse, treatment of alcoholism, um, pretty much any of these areas are going to have a pharmacotherapy that are involved in um, treatment. And um, we are in a very exciting time right now where we're looking at some of the new uh, possibilities um, by going back to these um, actually very um, old substances like psilocybin, which is a naturally occurring plant substance. I mean, it's a psychedelic drug. It uh, is growing in 200 kinds of mushrooms uh, that are species that are found around the planet. 
So um, we are, you know, our laboratory is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, and I like to think about that because um, our psychedelic mushrooms foods or drugs, uh, it's kind of hard to say because, uh, you know, a shiitake mushroom or a portobello mushroom is a food, and a psilocybin mushroom, uh, which has psilocin or psilocybin in it, uh, is a drug, and it needs to be, um, well, either controlled or in some places pro uh, prohibited from use. So, a uh, really interesting point to think about. But um, what I've been working on specifically over the last um, year and a half or so <coughs> is um, what can we do with psilocybin um, to help people who are uh, addicted to smoking. And so smoking is a really um, difficult habit to work on because um, it's completely legal. So if anybody in here is a smoker or wanted to be a smoker, you wouldn't have to go very far. You could just walk out of here and find the closest convenience store, gas station, uh, etc., and spend uh, however much it costs, seven bucks maybe, for a pack of cigarettes. And um, this is a, something that we know is extremely addictive uh, substance, and it also causes a lot of harm to um, you know users' personal health and um, a lot of cost to the economy in general in terms of um, either healthcare costs or loss of productivity, so people thinking stepping out to, to take smoke breaks is another one of these indices that they use to measure um, the amount of money that's lost uh, through tobacco addiction. And um, the reason that we're studying uh, tobacco addiction specifically is because uh, it's uh, kind of unique in terms of looking at addiction because if you're going to work with, uh, for instance, a heavy chronic drinker or uh, opioid user, uh, they'll oftentimes have a lot of these other psychosocial problems that need to be addressed. So they may have trouble um, keeping a steady job. They may have trouble keeping a steady residence. They may have trouble uh, keeping um, good relationships with the people around them. And all of those things really need to be addressed when you're talking about treatment of addiction. Uh, however, the people that we've been working with are surgeons, lawyers, uh, construction workers, people who have jobs, and they're daily smokers. So they don't necessarily have a lot of these other um, wraparound problems that need to be addressed when you're looking at uh, helping a person that has an addiction problem. Uh, so that's kind of why we focused uh, our, you know, our interest specifically on looking at smoking. And what we've done so far, um, since 2008, when the project started, and in the last year uh, when I came on, uh, we've run 15 people, they're heavy <coughs> smokers, um, they're average age of about 51 years. So these are not like 20 year olds who have been smoking for a few years and think it's really cool. These are 50 year olds who have been smoking for 30 years and are sick of it. And they're sick of spending $7 a day on a pack of a habit. They're sick of waking up coughing with a a sore throat and and so forth. So they they're really ready to give up the habit, and yet it's so it's so ingrained, it's so entrenched in their in their consciousness and in their daily life that it's it's extremely difficult. So um, just to give you a frame of reference, some of the quote unquote gold standards of treatment, like uh, pharmacologically speaking, would be Shantix, which is made by Pfizer, has like a somewhere between. A 25 and 35 percent success rate at six months in a year for people who are trying to quit. And so these are people who want to quit, who are spending money on a drug, who are going to their doctor saying, I want to stop doing this, and they're taking a course of medication, and it does not really seem to be sticking to about 70 percent of them. So that gives you kind of an idea of how hard it is to quit, because as I said, it's A, a very addictive substance, and the tobacco companies go out of their way to make sure that that is the case, and B, um, it's a very uh, accessible substance. So as I said you know, earlier, we can just walk out of here and go pick it up on a street corner, no problem. Um, so what we've done is use a, a sort of basic standard treatment uh, or therapy approach, which is called cognitive behavioral therapy. So we look at people's thoughts and their behaviors around smoking, we talk to them about it, we make friends with them, or we you know, develop a therapeutic rapport or therapeutic alliance in uh, technical jargon. And uh, once we do that, we basically um, get them prepared to do a course of three, two to three psilocybin sessions, uh, high dose sessions. This is based on what they call a psychedelic psychotherapy model, meaning that we use this high dose to um, produce a powerful altered state of consciousness, 
uh, in the laboratory under the supervision of myself and a uh, co-guide, usually a female. We like to do uh, pairs uh, of therapists, uh, you know, male female, to make everybody comfortable. And um, you know, we integrate that psilocybin um, dosage into the course of regular therapy, therapeutic treatment, and we help these people, um, many of whom have not had any uh, psychedelic experience in the past, some of whom have uh, as well, and we kind of help them integrate that experience into their lives. And what we're finding is that our results are really good so far um, when you're looking at them in, you know, in terms of what other drugs are doing. And so what that means is, right now, uh, last week we had our 12th participant out of 15 come in for their six month follow-up. So we do six and 12 month follow-ups. And out of those 12 people who have come in for their six month follow-up, 11 of them are still not smoking and have reported not smoking a single cigarette since they started, the, you know, since they got their, their first dose of psilocybin, which is a 91.6% success rate, which in the literature is unprecedented. And, um, you know, it's, it's really good. And it's a good indicator that this is um, an area that needs more investigation, obviously. Um, the problem with that is the prohibition of these drugs makes it extremely difficult to do any work with them. Uh, so, luckily, uh, you know, I was able to come on board with Matt Johnson and Will Griffiths, who are uh, renowned psychopharmacologists and who have uh, the benefit of working at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, a very reputable institution, and so we can do the work there. Um, there's also work with psilocybin happening at NYU um, and University of New Mexico. But other than that, um, across the country, it's not happening anywhere else that I know of, uh, at least not in a legal context. And uh, one of the main reasons for that is, again, the uh, federal prohibition of these kinds of drugs, which makes there be a lot of hoops to jump through um, before you get to research them. Um, so I think, uh, in conclusion, I just you know, wanted to say that we're doing a very small project. It's uh, not a controlled study, meaning that we're not doing placebo, we're not doing a blinding. Um, but we wanted to see, is this safe? And could it possibly work? And the answer is, yes, it's safe so far. Yes, it seems to possibly work so far. And, uh, you know, we'd like to do some more work to see uh, how can it help other smokers, how can it help people suffering from other substance abuse problems, whether it be alcoholism, uh, opioid dependence, and so forth. And um, it just doesn't really make sense, uh, um, you know, from a policy standpoint to say that let's investigate these drugs and let's not investigate these drugs because there's nothing to learn there. Um, and what we're finding is there's actually quite a bit to learn there, and we're hoping that um, more researchers and more people will come on board and, uh, you know, push the agenda. So thank you very much. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Very fascinating stuff where this is a, an example of a clinical study where psilocybin is being given. Our next speaker is going to um, talk about Another study, I think from a little bit of a different perspective, uh, Philippe Lucas is a graduate research, re graduate in graduate research with um, the Center for Addictions Research in British Columbia, and he's also the board chair of MAPS Canada, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the research study that he's working on. I think I'll stay there if you don't mind starting off with that. To say some words of wisdom from yesterday, all people are worth saving. Mm -hmm. Wolfman is a stoic man in his mid-30s who spoke about how hate and anger was infecting his work and uh, his personal relationships. During his second ayahuasca journey, he encountered his mother, and rather than directing his anger at her as had become their habitual interaction, he felt a deep sadness while in her presence. Quietly, he asked if he could put his head upon her chest. When she asked why, he answered that he just wanted to hear her heart. She allowed him closer, he slowly lowered his head upon her chest, his ears suddenly filled with a dull thump, 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 thump. It was likely the first noise he'd ever heard, and ultimately gave him life. Upon hearing his mother's heartbeat, he realized that his seemingly constant hate and anger were actually masking a great fear, sadness, and loneliness. As he gained this new self-awareness, he was filled with a deep love and comfort, both for her and for himself. And he couldn't wait to share this remarkable catharsis with his mother after he had returned from his journey. The ayahuasca study that I'm about to share with you is the most complex and engaging research project I've ever been a part of, and I look forward to presenting our process and findings with you here today. 
Dr. Gabor Mate is a physician uh, and author with over 10 years of experience working with addicts in Vancouver's downtown east side, which is the site of the highest concentration of injection drug users, hep C, and HIV AIDS in the Western world. Following a power powerful personal experience with ayahuasca, Dr. Mate teamed with three Western ayahuasqueros trained in the traditional indigenous Shipibo use of ayahuasca under the guidance of a master curandero to develop four to five day retreats called the Working with Addictions and Stress Retreats. Um, the retreats took place throughout Canada over the last few years and employed multiple healing modalities, including two guided ayahuasca healing ceremonies. And it's Dr. Uh, Gabor Mate's work with ayahuasca and addictions that's the core of this research project. So what is ayahuasca? Ayahuasca is a psychotropic brew prepared from the Amazonian vine Banisteriopsis capi and leaves of the bush Psychotria viridis. These plants contain respectively harmala alkaloids and dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, which when ingested in combination induce several hours of dreamlike altered state of consciousness characterized by intense visual, auditory, uh, ideational, and emotional effects. Ayahuasca has traditionally been drunk in ritual context by Amazonian, indigenous, and mestizo peoples for a variety of divinatory, magical, spiritual, aesthetic, and other cultural purposes. And the shamans and healers that have been trained to work with ayahuasca are often referred to as ayahuasqueros. The study consists of a detailed observational account of two separate retreats uh, and monthly in-person post-retreat follow-ups with a total of 12 participants from the Working with Addiction and Stress workshops. The study was intended to gather preliminary evidence on the ability of ayahuasca-assisted therapy to reduce patterns of problematic substance use and other psychological and physical addictions and compulsive behaviors. In April 2010, I was contacted by the director of the health office of the BC, BC Coastal First Nations Aboriginal Band, who'd heard about Dr. Gabor Mate's stress and addictions retreats and about her intention to study the outcome on participants. He asked if the retreats and associated study could be conducted with members of the band who were struggling with high rates of trauma and addiction resulting from multi-generational abuse related to colonization. During our first meeting with the band chief and council, the chief laid out a large picture of the residential school that stood on the band's land for over 70 years, and he told us that this was the root cause of the ongoing suffering, suffering and substance abuse that plagued his people from generation to generation. The primary focus of Canadian residential school programs was the separation of children from their families at a young age and long-term placement in boarding schools where traditional practices and languages were banned and often severely punished. Additionally, physical and sexual abuse were rampant. Following a dialogue about the multi-generational challenges facing the band as a result of colonization, the project received the blessing of Chief and Council and of the Council of Elders, and we were granted permission to use the band Longhouse, which was described by one retreat participant as being a combination of church, courthouse, and hospital. So this was not only a great honor, but also the most appropriate setting to test the potential of the Working with Stress and Addictions retreat. A total of eight participants, four men and four women, volunteered for the first retreat. And the second retreat took place in uh, the second retreat took place in September and involved 12 individuals, including four participants uh, from the first retreat. On the first day of the retreats, Dr. Mate asked participants to identify what was good about their addictions or compulsive behaviors. Answers include the numbing of physical and emotional pain, stemming from abuse, a gaining of a sense of belonging amongst other addicts needing a sense of escape from disappointment, stress, and personal issues, and trying to fill emotional voids. Dr. Mate suggested that all humans want to escape, escape pain and stress, to seek acceptance and a sense of belonging, and to try and fill emotional voids, and that using substances that help us do this seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do if no other means are available or apparent. In fact, he says the participants are actually pretty smart to seek ways to reduce their pain and achieve greater wholeness and liberation. When asked about the negative impacts of their, uh, of their addictions, all concluded that the apparent short-term benefits led to a worsening of pain, personal isolation, shame, and self-loathing. And this dialogue uh, really allowed participants and individuals with generally a great deal of shame and very poor so sense of self-worth to reconceptualize their own addictions beyond the personal weaknesses and shortcomings. And after dinner, all gathered back in the longhouse to discuss intentions for the ayahuasca journey. The ceremony begins with each participant called up by the curandero to ingest ayahuasca. Traditional Shipibo Wikeros 
or healing songs or sung by the Oscaros, and some participants begin to purge. All are called up for individual treatment, and after about four or five hours, the ceremony ends, and Oscaros leave, and participants slip into sleep. During the debrief the following morning, all but one participant described profound experiences in terms like beautiful, grateful, powerful, or repeated throughout the day. Building on the progress from the previous day and night, this process is essentially repeated for another night of ayahuasca, uh, ayahuasca and, and a final debriefing the following day. After the retreat, researchers follow up monthly with all participants for a six-month period, adding a qualitative interview at month six, and then the team repeated this process for another set of retreats in September 2011. Here's what we found. Despite the severity of trauma and addiction reported by participants, which included some participants that had failed out of drug treatment up to seven times, statistically significant improvements were demonstrated for scales assessing hopefulness, empowerment, mindfulness, and quality of life, meaning an outlook. Additionally, participants reported statistically significant reductions in problematic cocaine use, and self-reported alcohol and tobacco use also declined. However, cannabis and opiate use did not, which we suggest is likely because the use of, use of methadone and cannabis were actually medically prescribed for many in the study. Ultimately, all study participants reported positive and lasting changes and no significant adverse physical or psychological effects were reported. Given the credible biological and psychological me mechanisms behind these results, and the potential to decrease the personal suffering and social costs associated with addiction, we feel that further research on ayahuasca-assisted uh, addictions treatment is warranted. Clinical trials with those who've had poor outcomes with conventional psychological or pharmacological addictions therapy could be a good starting point to further our understanding of ayahuasca-assisted therapy for problematic substance use. These findings were published in the Journal of Current Drug Abuse Reviews in early 2013, and the paper is available on my website at philippelucas.com. In closing, I'd just like to uh, express my sincere gratitude to the anonymous First Nation fan who continue to offer us their trust and generosity, to Gabor Mate and the retreat team for having the strength and courage to bring this medicine where it might do the most good, and to my fellow researchers, Principal Investigator Gerald Thomas, uh, co-researchers uh, Riel Kapler, Ken Tupper, and, G and Gina Martin for their hard work and dedication. Additionally, my thanks to MAPS, Dr. Bronner Soaps, Tides Canada, and River Six Foundation and the Center and the Center for Addictions Research at BC for supporting this important research, and finally to DPA for hosting this presentation, and all of you for your time and attention and interest in this work. I really look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. So next we have John Harrison, who is a psychologist working in the field of addiction treatment and is particularly interested in addiction as a path to personal transformation. So we're going to find out what that means <laughs> from John right now. and especially to Jag and to Stephanie for your hard work. Thank you. Um, what can psychedelics teach us about addiction? Uh, that's a good question. And uh, I want to piggyback a little on uh, uh, Philippe's reference to Gabor Mate. Because I have a, a wonderful... Oh, I'm sorry. Is that better? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, and a quote cited by uh, Gabor Mate in his wonderful volume, um, In the Realm of the Hungry Ghosts, which I highly recommend, by the way in the realm of hundred ghosts. Uh, he quotes Alice Miller, a Swiss psychologist, and she asks, what is addiction really? And then uh, answers, it is a sign, a signal, a symptom of distress. It is a language that tells us about a plight that must be understood. In other words, it's a journey. And uh, I, I find that psychedelics can be a very useful guide in this journey. Uh, if you use with, uh, intention, conscious intention, and, and awareness. Uh, they can be a powerful tool in the toolkit. Um, how many here have uh, heard of Ibogaine? Okay, that figures. <laughs> That's true, yeah. And uh, how many here have done Ibogaine? That also figures. Okay. 
<laughs> so that's Bill. <laughs> um, so let me tell you a little bit about, I'll give you a little bit of an overview because I understand we only have about 12 minutes, so I'm going to give a brief overview of some history of Ibogaine. And if I skip over anything, it's just because everything's contracted, but please feel free to ask in the Q&A afterward. Um, Ibogaine was used by the, the, the Buiti people in Gabon for, for centuries as a rite of passage and a way of communing with ancestors. And it comes from the Cabernet that Voga shrub, <coughs> Uh, which uh, grows indigenous to Gabon, and uh, it is uh, used the root bark powder with the iboga root was used traditionally by the Ouija. Uh, and uh, fa fascinating, fascinating uh, medicine. And they used, by the way, uh, not gender specific, which is unusual for rites of passage, uh, uh, which I thought I always liked that <laughs> fact actually. Um, so what happened was used for many, many hundreds of years, and then. Uh, in the early 1960s, a, a, a better, I'm sorry, um, a fellow by the name of Howard Lotsoff, a, uh, he was a drug user in the uh, East Village of, um, in Ruinous Village. And he, uh, he like, oh, yeah, let's try a new drug. <laughs> okay. Um, so he um, heard about Ibogaine. And he was a heroin addict at the time. So uh, he did this amazing medicine. And um, two days later, he was not withdrawing or craving heroin at all, which he found rather amazing and remarkable. So he gave it to five of his friends, or six of his friends, and uh, they all pretty much had the same response. No longer interested in this, uh, in heroin or opiates at all. And uh, so that set him off on a long journey of self-discovery and also uh, humanitarian work to make this medicine accessible and safe. Uh, he passed away a few years ago, but we're very indebted to Howard. He spent most of his life trying to uh, share this wonderful tool. So basically, that's where they, we came to. We came to that place, and we're still working on it because it's illegal in this country, and that's a whole other conversation about politics and why is it illegal. First of all, it's got the name psychedelic in it, okay? And it is a psychedelic. And so that makes it a little bit, um, it, what should we say, uh, it intimidates people. And it can be scary for the so-called establishment to want to embrace it. Um, so how did, I, how did I come to this work? I, I uh, was a, uh, in graduate school and uh, very interested in, in Addiction. I had a brother who died of alcoholism, and so that brought me toward. I was interested in addiction, and I, I got a position as a, a in my pre-doctoral internship at a methadone clinic in Oakland, California. Uh, really, the belly of the beast type of thing. I had 36 patient caseload, and uh, was working at the methadone clinic, and really came to quickly see uh, the cynicism inherent in methadone treatment. Although it has some use usefulness. Uh, but it is the, in the default, it's been the default uh, uh, treatment, and uh, it's sadly lacking. Essentially, now the government's our dealer, is what it amounts to. Uh, first one's free, little girl. So, um, uh, the, that, that was, it turned me off, and then of course, I was, my natural inclination is toward transformation, so I'm thinking, well, why don't we try to get these folks off of the, off the method, or maybe taper them down, and so that they can actually have a life without being a daily user of methadone. In fact, the methadone clinic would open at 5.30 in the morning, so I, uh, I, I know that they would come in for their morning methadone and often would double dip in the afternoon with their heroin, which is very common. So, but then I started, I said, well, I talked to the, the administrators of this methadone clinic, why don't we try to uh, uh, taper these folks off of the, of the heroin, of the, excuse me, of the, of the methadone. And they were really aghast that I would want to do that. So I saw that cynicism. And then at that, almost at that very same time, a, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Rick Doblin, a president of MAPS, said to me, hey, why don't you do some Ibogaine research? And, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, uh, and so I said, hey, that sounds good. And I just heard about Ibogaine very synchronistically at the same time. So then I, um, a couple years went by and I started, I was the first principal investigator for a long-term study on the efficacy of Ibogaine in the treatment of opiate addiction in Mexico, a MAP-sponsored study. 
and uh, just came to see how remarkable and miraculous this medicine is. Uh, literally, folks would come in on a Monday night or Monday afternoon, and they would do the medicine on Tuesday, usually. And then by Wednesday night, they were no longer withdrawing or craving opiates. And this is unequivocal. So that in itself is miraculous. Okay, that's just, the, that's just where we start. And so then I saw also in following up with folks that the more that I followed up with them, the more um, what we used to call aftercare, I've changed the terminology to continuing care, because it's not an afterthought. But to me, in my opinion, it's a seamless part of the treatment, and it should be. It shouldn't be separate at all. And what I came to discover was that, and through our research and following up with folks, that uh, just a contact with, the, with folks from the clinic, with people that work there, it made a huge difference in their outcomes. And so I, I think that, frankly, integration work, what I call it integration work or continuing care work, is really the sine qua non or the necessary thing for uh, this work. Um, otherwise, oftentimes folks will do this medicine and then they'll, three weeks later, they'll, or maybe two months later, more likely, uh, they will um, possibly slip, or some people will call it relapse. So, so uh, there's so much to say about this. <laughs> so I will say, though, that um, what I've come to discover is that, that, this, that after the treatment, that there is a probably 10 to 12 week, what we call window of well-being, post-treatment of Ibogaine. And where folks are uh, really open, it's a fertile time for personal change and transformation. That for the, maybe for the, some of them, the first time in decades that they've been at baseline, so that they can actually uh, have their feelings. They're not numb. I mean, most of these folks came to uh, heroin use or, or other opiates like OxyContin because of incredible emotional pain or physical pain. And guess what's the best pain reliever in the world? Heroin. It works. That pain goes away. It does go away temporarily. But what we found, and this is my bad pun for the day, we found that, uh, uh, that uh, Ibogaine really does stop heroin in its tracks. <laughs> so, but it really, and it really does. At least it stops it temporarily. It's not a cure. That's a very important thing to know, and I, I have to. T I, I think sometimes there's a lot of hyperbole around it, and we don't want to set the bar too high because the truth is that the work begins after the treatment. And how do we integrate this medicine? What do we learn from it? And so this 10 to 12 week period of window well-being is a really, as I say, juicy time as a therapist and actually as a human being to witness this personal transformation. And I, I don't tell my patients this, but I would do it for free. Because <laughs> it's it's really exciting. It's it's an honor, and uh, I'm very grateful to them for for their openness, their bravery, their courage to take this medicine. Uh, so much more to say about ibogaine, uh, but we're touching on it just a little bit here today. If anyone has any questions, please shoot them at us later. Okay, thank you. heard so far from um, three people who are engaged in clinical studies, research studies, working with people who um, have acknowledged that they have drug use problems and are seeking some form of treatment. But as we probably all know in the room, um, not everybody is at the point at which they are ready to say that they have a problematic relationship with drug use. And not everybody uh, seeks out formal treatment. However, some people end up uh, treating themselves maybe informally, and oftentimes this can happen in a festival setting, in a nightlife setting, um, where psychedelics are being used in that way, um, either acknowledged or not acknowledged, um, to deal with these personal pains and, and, and issues that John just uh, discussed. So our next speaker is going to take us into that realm of uh, psychedelics use and how they relate to misuse and addiction. Linnae Pont is the harm reduction coordinator and clinical research assistant at MAPS. She also runs MAPS Zendo Project, which does psychedelic harm reduction at festivals. So please welcome Linnae.
Good afternoon. How's the volume? Good. Great. So I had a whole segue prepared, but <laughs> Steph, you said it much more concisely than I was going to be able to, so I'm just going to dive right in. And yeah, I'm going to talk to you about the Zendo project today and how we can reduce the harms um, related to psychedelic drug use outside of medical and clinical contexts. So when I used to hear the term harm reduction, I would usually think of two main things, needle exchange programs and safer sex programs. And then when I started working at MAPS, I found out, oh, there's all of these psychedelic harm reduction organizations that are doing two main things. Uh, and the first is providing unbiased educational information, and that's usually through web forums. There's two main organizations doing this, and one is Irwid, and the other is Blue Light. And the second form of harm reduction that these organizations are doing is providing on-site support at events. And what that looks like is basically a space where people can go and receive help and support if they're having a difficult experience. There's lots of organizations doing this. I only named a few because they wouldn't all fit on this slide. But some of the main ones um, are Dance Safe and Amplify, uh, the Full Circle Tea House, Tripsit, New Whip, Zendo, and Bunk Police. And Dance Safe and Bunk Police do something that is unique in that they offer um, drug testing. They, they offer drug screening, adulterant testing. So the mission statement of the Zendo project has three main parts. The first is to create a safe space for anyone who's undergoing a difficult psychedelic experience in order to help transform the experience into something that can become a valuable learning opportunity and maybe even lead to some personal growth. And at the same time, this functions to reduce the number of psychiatric related hospitalizations and arrests that happen at these events. Basically, when somebody is on a psychedelic, it's not really appropriate for them to be in a medical tent where medical staff aren't trained to sit with someone for 12 hours who's on a high dose of LSD, and they really don't want to deal with that either. And they have more things to deal with that are medical related. And people sometimes are thrown into jails if they're tripping, and that's definitely not the place for them either. So the second part of the mission statement is to provide training for volunteers in a space where they can um, provide one another feedback and support. And in this way, um, it's a great opportunity for anyone who is interested in being a psychedelic therapist. Um, this work is all sponsored by MAPS, and we um, you know, are doing studies looking at MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. And in about two to three years, we're going to need a lot of therapists when we start our phase three multi-site studies. So one of the biggest challenges that we have is training two to three hundred therapists to carry out this work, especially because, as you can imagine, it's hard to be able to work with someone who is on a psychedelic to receive training whenever this is illegal. So this is one opportunity where they can legally do this. And the third part is just to demonstrate that as a community, we can work together to reduce the potential risks of psychedelic drug use. And we can do this without the need for law enforcement based policies. A fourth thing that I sometimes mention, just for fun, is that we don't need to tranquilize people who are on psychedelics and by just providing a safe space and sitting with them, um, we can help them in that way. So Boom Festival takes place in Portugal every other year, and I had the opportunity to go last year. It's a 25,000 person festival, um, psychedelic festival, and it's unique because in 2001, Boom decriminalized all drugs. So in 2002, some MAP staff went over and said, hey, let's build the world's model for psychedelic harm reduction. And it's um, currently directed and led by Maria Carvalho, who is a university professor in Portugal. And it's the world's model because it's funded by the local government, by the festival itself, and it's in a centralized area of the festival. It's in the guidebook. Everybody knows where it is, what it's for, what people go for, and you don't have to feel weird or ashamed if you're having a difficult trip. And you just need some help and you need some support. Uh, and the other thing that makes them the world's model is they offer adulterate screening. 
This is a picture of my friend Leandro, and he's standing next to a sign that says, Drug checking, 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. near the dance temple. <laughs> so you can take a sample of something to this booth and have them run it through thin layer chromatography and return in about an hour, and they'll be able to tell you all the adulterants that were in the sample. And then they'll take that sample and they'll tape it up onto a piece of poster board, write what it's being sold as, Right, what it's actually got in it, and then take a picture of that and project it onto large screens near the dance stages throughout the event. <laughs> that was it, though. That makes too much sense for you. Know. <laughs> that might save lives. I know. <laughs> <laughs> So Mouse was involved with helping um, with harm reduction at Burning Man from 2003 to 2007. And the program grew quite large very quickly under the direction of Valerie Majenko, who trained hundreds of volunteers. And we were working with Burning Man Org at this time. Basically because MAPS contains the word psychedelic in it, Burning Man Org became allergic to the liability involved and had to shut down our involvement with it. So there was a five-year hiatus from 07 to 2012. And last year, we were contacted by some organizers of a large psychedelic camp that is at Burning Man that has no affiliation with Burning Man Org. And they said, hey, you know, we're putting on a great party, but we really need some harm reduction support. Can you come and lead a training and coordinate some volunteers? So. Uh, we decided to test it out. And this was a picture of our training. We had loads of interests. We had to actually tell volunteers that we couldn't accept everyone. We had 60 volunteers and we helped over 100 guests throughout the week. We kept the space open 24-7 and provided water and um, you know, a place to rest and you know, compassionate care for anybody in need. And you know, a place to rest is it's really important because you know, some of the people who come in are on psychedelics, and some of the people who come in are in need of integration support. Some of the people don't really know what's going on with them, maybe they were dosed or whatever, but baseline conditions at a place like Burning Man in the Nevada desert are dehydrated, exhausted, and sleep deprived. So after Burning Man last year, I was approached by a number of event organizers from other events who said, hey, we found out what you're doing. It sounds really important. Can you come train some volunteers for us? And I had the opportunity to do this um, and establish a harm reduction center at an event in Costa Rica called, Costa Rica called Envision, um, and then at an event in San Francisco called Bicycle Day that takes place every April. And, um, at an event, it's the largest regional burn. It's called Africa Burn, and it's in South Africa, and it's in May. And I think this this burn is going to become the, the other leading model if we can start doing drug checking there. I was able to work directly with the rangers, the medical staff, um, and the directors, and um, they actually were triaging me out to cases in the field where the medical staff were just sort of dumbfounded on what to do. So that's that's really the ideal situation where we can closely work with medical and triage back and forth. And I'll just say at Burning Man, we always staff at least one to two medical volunteers for every shift in order to triage. This year at Burning Man, we had twice the number of volunteers. Our board, of, our board member, David Bronner, donated a uh, art car for us called Rainbow Bridge that shuttled guests and volunteers between the Zendo and a sister harm reduction space called the Full Circle Tea House, which was founded by Annie Oak, who also founded the Women's Visionary Congress. Just really briefly, there's four basic principles to psychedelic harm reduction. The first is creating a safe space. It's absolutely essential to provide a, a you know, a, a safe container for anybody who's having a difficult psychedelic experience. And the second one, sitting not guiding. Our volunteers don't guide, they don't steer the ship, they really just hold the space so that the person can feel safe and deepen into the experience. Along that thread, talk through, not talk down. 
we're never trying to shorten the experience at all. We're never trying to take away from it. What we're doing is, again, holding space so that they can deepen in, surrender, and get any um, you know potential therapeutic outcomes that, that may come about. Because when somebody takes a psychedelic, as many of us in here probably know, sometimes trauma comes up to the surface. Sometimes we remember things that we may have tried to repress actively or not actively repressed, and we didn't even know that was there. So we do on-the-fly psychological support. And then lastly, <coughs> difficult is not the same as bad. I'm sure many of us can agree with this. Some of our most challenging experiences at the end of the day can become our most valuable. So there are large electronic dance community events that take place year-round, but primarily in the summer, all internationally. And at Electric Zoo, which took place over Labor Day weekend, there were two Molly-related deaths. Now, Molly is... I don't know. It's a marketing gimmick. It's a bag of white powder. And some people think it's ecstasy, some people think that it's MDMA. Basically, it's whatever the drug dealer has adulterated it with, and however many hands that it's passed through is how much more adulterated that it is. Two people died at Electric Zoo. They had to actually cancel the last day of the event, and this is just one of many examples of how the, the war on drugs is leading to casualties. So a couple weeks after Electric Zoo took place, there was an event in Atlanta called Tomorrow World. And Tomorrow World was put on by European promoters, IBNT. And in Europe, harm reduction is required. And Tomorrow World promoters invited DanceSafe to come and provide drug education. Let's hear it for DanceSafe. waiting to see, oh, is this going to create some sort of media backlash? Because that's what has happened in the past. Um, for example, when this public service announcement was released in 2010 after the electric Daisy Carnival deaths, this was not allowed to be released. It was created, and it's basically some DJs who put this together, and it's a harm reduction video saying, hey, if you're going to take ecstasy or MDMA, Drink water, but not too much. Don't take more than one. Things like that. This was not allowed to be released. And just a couple weeks ago, after the Electric Zoo and after Tomorrow World, it was released. So as tragic as the deaths were, it shows that there are more people speaking out about the need for harm reduction. And I, I hesitate to say that we're at a tipping point already, but I think that the tipping point may be along the horizon. So my take home message is that we need to put science and education before politics. And if you're interested in volunteering, I'm gonna be going to the same circuit of events that I went to this past year, and I'm always actively seeking more volunteers. So come chat with me after this, or check us out online. Should we get in for it? <laughs> okay, so we have heard about psychedelics uh, for addiction treatment, we've heard about them in clinical settings, we've heard about them in more ritualistic settings, we've heard about them, John talked about a transformational process. Lene brought us to the festival setting where it's a little bit, people may be experiencing things, trauma being addressed with the psychedelic harm reduction that Zendo Project offers. And our final speaker um, is going to take us, kind of give us a, a, a recap of all of the different um, possibilities that psychedelics offer. He is the coordinator of the Horizons Conference in New York. It's not the He's heavily involved. <laughs> He's heard of uh, I've been to the right. He knows what he's talking about. And he is also, um, he's a psychologist that works with people with problematic drug use, and he's developed this uh, radical alternative approach um, called integrative harm reduction psychotherapy. So please welcome Andrew Tatarski. So, first I want to say, uh, this is kind of like a coming out party. Um, 
I've been working with drug users uh, with, with problematic relationships to drugs for 35 years. I've been a fan of psychedelics for 45 years. <laughs> but because I came into the addiction treatment field and um, have kind of played a role as a very reasonable mainstream clinician who's very concerned about patient care and increasing our ability to be helpful to people struggling with drugs, and from that standpoint came to discover a new framework for helping people that we call harm reduction psychotherapy or I, I call integrative harm reduction psychotherapy which is a radical alternative to what's done out in the field which uh, is an abstinence only disease model based approach which is an abysmal failure for the overwhelming majority of people. Um, this radical new approach um, was radical enough, and uh, I've been concerned for many years that coming out and speaking about psychedelics would just put the whole kibosh on it, sort of like discredit, you know, what maybe is a radical idea coming from a reasonable condition, but now the guy's gone completely insane. <laughs> so, you know, enough with him. Uh, but I think the fact that I can actually be here today talking as a mainstream addiction treatment uh, professional about the uh, incredible uh, potential of psychedelics to teach us about addiction and to provide a number of new, new possible tools for the healing of it speaks to a sea change that's happening in the field right now. And I think um, the field of addiction treatment is uh, by and large beginning to realize that the older approaches don't work and that we need radical new alternatives. So it's a kind of a growing up and an opening up to new possibilities, which I think is partly um, now uh, creating a space where addiction treatment professionals, the community can become more interested in looking at the research. The research has really provided a growing empirical basis to support you know, um, a serious look. And I think the, the work that many kind of people have been doing to publicize all of this is having an impact on the broader culture. So this is a very special moment where, um, uh, you know, for consideration of this. Um, I wanted to just mention a couple of anecdotal experiences. You know, as a treatment professional over 35 years, I've had maybe one person come to me with an addictive relationship to psychedelics. And, and my, my whole approach, the whole harm reduction approach is about uh, uh, accepting people wherever they are, have whatever goals they're willing or interested in working on, you know, around reduced use, safer use. Uh, you know, we want to help people develop uh, more healthy and ideal relationships to substances. We don't want to just get them to do something that we want them to do. So this approach really is about creating a space that um, makes treatment appealing, I mean, and, and interesting, and, and people want to come and talk about their issues. And I have had, as I said, very, I mean, this is just 35 years of anecdotal experience, but that by and large we can conclude uh, that psychedelics are not addictive substances. I think some of them have some addictive potential, like ketamine, and, and people can develop addictive compulsive relationships, but by and large, that's not what this is about. On the other hand, I've had anecdotal uh, experiences with patients that really um, confirm or, or are in sync with what the research has shown, which I've had a number of people coming to me who have had, uh, in some cases, one psychedelic experience that effectively changed their relationship to um, you know, abused substances like uh, opiates and uh, stimulants and so on. One experience that was transformative. Um, and this is what we've heard here. Um, so, uh, from my own experience in the research, it seems like we really need to be considering this. But I, I want to um, put this in a, in a broader context, because I think in the field and in our society, um, we're in the midst of a scientific revolution in the way that we understand prop, you know, drugs, drug users, problematic drug use, and um, we need, to, we need to come up with a new paradigm. Uh, we have all grown up with, and the field, the culture is dominated by this old disease 
uh, addiction disease paradigm. And where there, many of us are trying to struggle to get away from it, it infuses um, our, our culture and our thinking. And it's a very reductionistic, one-size-fits-all, um, uh, really dis um, dismal kind of approach that um, you know, predicts failure in treatment, essentially. But we're moving toward what I think of as a, um, a new uh, psycho-biosocial spiritual model. Uh, what, you know, it's a complicated name that attempts to capture um, the fact that problematic relationships to substances are really complicated. They're multiply determined. And they are unique for each individual. And, and what I mean, and, and where I'm going with this, is that I think psychedelics have something to uh, support, the, the, the data has, will support this new emerging model and will also be able to teach us something about it. But essentially, our, our, you know, we have a growing amount of data that genetics, that trauma, that problems of self-regulation, that psychosocial problems, uh, racism, homophobia, um, uh, and so on and so on, all are correlated with problematic uh, substance use and addiction. Um, but, uh, and as well as uh, the fact that these substances can be fun and can be helpful to people in many ways. So we, we need to have a model that can integrate the fact that um, there are these multiple issues that come together in unique ways that contribute to problematic use. And so I've started to think about the concept of multiple pathways to addiction or to substance misuse, which then require multiple pathways to recovery. Um, now, I think that one of the things that we're hearing on this panel and, and that we're learning is that um, different psychedelic substances have different methods of action. Uh, some of them seem to have pharmacological methods of action. Some seem to uh, be facilitating a certain kind of insight and, and uh, ability to, to facilitate um, uh, processing uh, trauma. Some seem to facilitate an increased kind of sense of spiritual connection and connection to, um, to the planet and to others. And so each of these different um, methods of action seem to have positive impact with people with addictive disorders. And that, I think, is a research and empirical basis that supports this new emerging model. Um, and so I think that that's going to be some very important uh, input to support that. But also, I think that within this re uh, emerging research, we need to be then looking at um, which seem to be the patient characteristics that are most associated with success with these different substances. Um, and, and that, in turn, also will support our um, being able to refine this psychobiosocial spiritual model. And I think that that will be very important. Um, now, finally, um, well, but I think it's also important for us to consider what we heard today is all anecdotal, small subjects, self-referred, you know, beautiful work, and uh, that is probably consistent with the experiences of many people in this room. But, you know, they're preliminary studies that are providing support for the next phase, which is where we can do controlled, you know, double-blind studies, uh, much more rigorous uh, studies um, that will <clears throat> give us much stronger data to support the efficacy of these medicines. And then also we can go on to take a look at, for example, um, comparing psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy with um, some of the other uh, trauma-focused uh, treatments that are out there, you know, EMDR and so on. It would be very interesting to see, are they working with the same basic processes, um, uh, mechanisms of action, or are they different? Is, are, are the psychedelic processes superior to these other ones? So I think that's the future, which is really an exciting place to go. And, and, and that was another thing that jumped out at me. In the discussions, we didn't really hear much discussion, although, of course, they had no time, and I'm sure they could riff about this for a long time, but about the actual mechanisms of action. 
And that's, I think, where this field needs to be going. And I know there is at least one person in the room, Ingmar, uh, who's devoted his career to that mission. I think that that's really where you know, the new generation of researchers needs to be going, looking into me mechanisms of action. You know, what is it about the substance that facilitates a certain positive outcome in a therapeutic context or in a ritual context or whatever? And how do these different factors interact in the therapeutic effect? Um, just finally, the idea that, you know, the question, can these drugs revolutionize addiction treatment? I think if some of these miraculous effects can be shown to uh, be replicated, uh, with larger groups of people, um, this is clearly revolutionary. It will revolutionize the field. But I don't think that we have enough data um, to be able to make that claim at this point. They have trem I think that the data suggests tremendous promise, and um, such that the addiction treatment community is now uh, becoming interested. And in fact, that's another thing that I've been talking with Rick and others about, which is how we can now start much more actively bringing this work in professional settings toward, in, you know, that addiction treatment professionals can begin to become educated by and so on. So I think that's what I have to say. Thank you, Andrew. That was a really good um, summary, kind of bringing it back all together about what we heard. Um, if I got that right, you know, we're always up out there trying to provide as many forms of tr to treatment as there are possible. And then I heard maybe also that it may be different psychedelics might be good for different types of addictions. And maybe one, of, one day we can just say, why don't you just go to a festival and <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> Um, so it's fun, <laughs> it's fun time now where um, you all get to join the conversation. I'm going to give our speakers up here a couple of mics. And I'm going to come down into the audience and hear from you guys. Um, we'll start with you since he referenced you in the last speech. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so this is a question for the whole panel. And I'm interested in knowing, you know, how would you respond if you sort of were working with somebody who were, was to sort of... Um, validate the treatment or so support the treatment, they say, okay, well, these uh, substances can help with addiction, but let's get rid of the side effects, the psychedelic side effects. I mean, we kind of saw that with Ibogaine. I don't know if it's been tried in clinical trials yet, but sort of they've developed a form of Ibogaine that doesn't have any of the psychedelic effects, but treats um, you know, craving and, and uh, dogged. Yeah, that's <coughs> Uh, I'd like to address that. Um, it, anecdotally, again, as Andrew referenced, um, I, I really think that uh, my experience is I've taken I've been twice, um, and I did it for psychospiritual reasons. But I think the actual process of getting sick, for example, if you get nausea or purge, is, is actually part of the process. It's, part, it's actually a healing process. And so to make it user-friendly sounds good. Maybe that would work. But I think that diving into the medicines, these are plant medicines, these are sacred plant medicines, some of them, most of them, all of them, all of them except maybe LSD is not a plant, specifically. But so you've got um, this, this context in which it came from, um, which is all about a relationship with the plant. So to, to, to eliminate that or excise that from the treatment protocol, I believe, is, I, I intuitively believe it's a mistake. Um, However, more research needs to be done on that, for sure. And I want to say one more thing. I didn't really get a chance to talk about the, me not the mechanism of action neurologically, but the um, actual experience of being on Ibogaine. And I wanted to say that, for those who don't know, it's about a 24 to 36 hour journey, or I call it a ride. <laughs> okay? And uh, there's some often purging early on in the ride and uh, a period of ataxia, which is uh, last four to six hours, uh, which is essentially uh, you're about to ambulatory. You need help getting to the bathroom, for example, for the first few hours. So you really don't, this is not something you do on your own. It's not a recreational drug. And then uh, after the four to six hour period, there's a period of um, what we call the introspection phase. 
which is very valuable, I think, for specifically for, well, it can help in any, in any issue you might have percolating up, but specifically for addiction issues, that some of the issues or traumas that may have precipitated your addiction can be really identified and, and um, processed in, in the process, in, in the action of, of, of doing this medicine. So I just wanted to get that in there. I'd, uh, I'd add a couple more things. I totally appreciate the question, and I know that it's uh, just to help us frame our, our thinking as much as anything else, but I think that the benefit of these substances, we, we talk, we're talking and presenting about the substances, but I think that the real benefit is the, the deep state of alter consciousness that comes with these substances, the introspection that that allows, the, uh, the psycho-spiritual healing that that allows. And so the question comes from kind of a biomedical approach. And there's good reasons. We've all looked at them, and you know, in my publication, and, and, and I'm sure in other publications that uh, that are coming out of these studies, we can identify some uh, pathways and, and mechanisms why that is. But I don't think that actually these approaches are biomedical. I think that uh, ultimately, if they were purely biomedical, I don't think that you would see the correlation with reduction in substance use with a greater hopefulness or measures of empowerment mindfulness, quality of life, I think that that connection points to something greater going on. So I think that there are definitely some biomedical uh, and, and some pathways that, that are important that we need to identify that, that create, that reduce the biological cravings, etc. But I think that ultimately the healing and the uh, dealing with trauma is psycho-spiritual and that's what these substances help us uh, tap into and benefit from. I'll just say that yesterday... Yeah, that's just... yeah. So yesterday in a panel, uh, Jim Fadiman told a, a great story about some of the early work that he did um, with alcoholics using LSD for the treatment of their addiction. And he said that for those who got a high dose LSD and had a entheogenic mystical unit of experience, that it appeared to be significantly effective to um, treat their addiction. Now for those who only got a psycholytic dose, and did not have a deep unitive mystical experience, they saw some cool stuff that they could talk about when they went back to the bar. <laughs> Dialogue strip. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you guys for coming here, uh, and thank you for the work you do. Um, it's an honor to be really close to all of you. Um, all right, so I have a question um, predominantly for Philippe and John, and in the interest of time, Unfortunately, you might have to summarize your answers, but um, both of you referred to, to treatment, um, and I'm, I'm talking from the caregiver perspective, not from the person undergoing the experience, but from the caregiver perspective, you talked about treatment. Um, for example, in the ayahuasca trials, it came up for treatment, you said, um, before they entered their sleep state, and in the Ibogaine trials, you discussed both, obviously, the treatment while they're undergoing the drug experience, and then the repeated treatment afterwards, and I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit more about what that entails from the caregiver perspective and what that treatment is actually like. Sure. With, um, certainly the, the treatments, um, the Oscaros themselves gave a very different treatment than Gabor Mate. Gabor Mate is a Western trained uh, physician and so his treatments um, his, uh, included didactic education on the causes and consequences of compulsive behavior, individual group psycho-emotional counseling, mindfulness, meditation, um, those were the kind of treatments that he did. With the Ayos Garos, the treatments were much more traditional, indigenous. The singing of the Garos over a person as they lay before you is a pretty traditional way that, that Ayos Garos help individuals. Um, it's interesting to note that um, in, in the Amazonian basin where these, uh, uh, these substances are used traditionally, a lot of the time the person being treated doesn't ingest ayahuasca, the ayahuasca does. And the ayahuasca gets visions about how to treat the individual, the cause of the, the problem with the individual. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, we all like to be involved in Western communities. So I think that we just, you know, the, the ingestion of ayahuasca for us is part of the, part of the healing, but it's not a, necessarily a, a key part of the healing as far as the traditional uses are done. Um, within neo-shamanistic practices, it's fair to say that one of my favorite healers who uses ayahuasca also incorporates Reiki, uh, TCM practices, traditional Chinese medicine practices, uh, to, to move energy, and I found those to be very, very effective, very powerful, particularly in the state of altered consciousness uh, produced by ayahuasca. But um, yeah, that's kind of a split between the Western and the, uh, the non-Western medicines. Yeah, just to uh, piggyback a little bit on that for a leap. Um, with the uh, Abigail, uh, it's usually one treatment. 
uh, is what happens. And during that treatment, as I said, uh, most folks are not able to move, especially the beginning of it. Uh, we, we usually sit with them and uh, let them have their own experience. We don't, as, as uh, Lene referenced, we don't guide. We sit with them. And because their, their experience is their own, it's unique to them. And, and this whole idea is it's about empowering them to make their own choices in life and helping them to help themselves ultimately. As, as I tell my patients, you got to drive yourself home. You know? So, but the um, actual work with uh, um, the process of the uh, ibogaine is uh, the real material comes percolating up after the experience. That's when the process really happens, and so you, you're onto something there. It's like that's when. Um, it's helpful to have, and not a guide, but someone who can give you a feedback loop. One of the measures that we used in the MAP study that I did was we called it the peak experience profile, for example, which was kind of kind of a crazy bunch of questions. I know Richard Jensen, that's Richard Jensen's thing. And it's that they're nutty questions, like, did you see crazy snakes on the wall during the experience? I mean, like, like that, right? And the idea of, of, of having that um, um, uh, measure was to, um, to simulate. Uh, linguistically, folks, to actually articulate and uh, and then henceforth integrate the experience better. So it was it was it's real powerful and uh, um, uh, people uh, people said that I became their favorite drug. And I say, when was the last time you did it? Oh, 20 years ago. I'm still processing. It. <laughs> okay, so yeah. it's like that. Yeah. Other questions? I do uh, workshops at festivals on safe tripping when I can actually get the platform. And afterwards, I get a lot of people coming up to me to talk about difficult experiences or how can they use a psychedelic to work out their addiction issues. So I'm really careful about giving out advice for that kind of thing. But I also know that it's really hard outside of certain parts of the country to find therapists who will work with you on those issues. So if all else fails and they decide to go ahead and proceed with something on their own because everything else is not working for them, what would you all say are really good continuing care elements for them to incorporate that maybe if they don't have a therapist who can help them with it, their community can help them with that, with those factors? That's a great question. Who wants to take it? Well, I mean, I, I, I was just thinking as we were talking, it kind of relates to what your question is. Um, you know, everyone who has had an amazing weekend with a really wonderful group of people kind of in ritual and felt transformed by that experience uh, goes back to work or school or whatever and they, they go back to being the same old schmuck that they were. <laughs> we, you know, we, I'm a schmuck. So, you know, insight and, and transformative experiences um, can can open up all sorts of possibilities, but we are hearing here about the real significant importance of integrating. And, you know, addictive uh, behavior, addictive experiences, addictive um, process, really, um, gets ingrained in our way of being in the world over years and years, and is supported by our lifestyles, and, you know, if there are difficult lifestyle experiences that we go back to face, whether it's poverty or homelessness or family stress or racism or... Um, or and just think about the criminalization and stigmatization of drug use, which makes all of us drug users um, have to carry something that's problematic. You know, th there needs to be some kind of aftercare support, whether it's a support group, whether it's a counselor, whether it's a therapist, in cases where the issues are much more profound and entrenched and difficult. Um, and one thought that I had is MAPS should have, or some organizations should have, a clearinghouse of sort of psychedelically informed or, or activated clinicians. Okay, so th that's, that's a resource or support groups that um, exist. You know, in New York City, there's a MAPS potluck, and people can hook into a kind of a community of support where they can go to, and there are some psychedelically-minded psychotherapists in, you know, in that community. So 
I think it's about seeking out support in a wide variety of, of places. I'm actually going to go to Albert because I think I remember in your study that there was a big emphasis on how to integrate the experience after the fact. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's really important, obviously, to if somebody's having a profound altered state of consciousness uh, and a very powerful experience, which might be mystical or might be very difficult, um, to spend time working, uh, working through it uh, and processing it. And so we work with people for um, three months, and we don't give them any psychedelic drugs the first month. I just get to know them. The second month, uh, we do two moderate and then high doses. And then the third month, we do one last high dose. And that whole time, we're really working on talking about whatever uh, come, came up you know, during the session. How is that coming, in, coming up in your day-to-day -day life? Uh, is that coming up in your dream life at all? Um, so really, there's a lot of different avenues of approach. And it, it's a person-centered uh, person orientation that, um, that, I, that I espouse, which is um, it depends on the person. It depends on their experience, um, how, you know, how you're going to help them integrate that. But of course, the support is, is absolutely integral, because uh, we don't expect to give people a high dose of psilocybin and say, stop smoking and goodbye. <laughs> uh, you, know, you really need to spend time um, helping them uh, mull that over and, and get to a point where they can use that to their benefit. Okay. Can I, add I think that we also have to differentiate between uh, psychedelics that work well within um, a therapeutic setting, within a talk therapy setting, and that's of course MDMA, psilocybin, and LSD, and the research that that does. There's communication during the journey and the trip. Whereas with um, Ibogaine and Ayahuasca, people are usually too debilitated and in too deep a state of consciousness, so there actually isn't any communication or talking that happens beyond, you know, beyond small talk anyway, uh, help to the washroom, that kind of stuff. So I think, to, in my mind, uh, mindfulness, safe set and setting, that's, those are the key. Uh, intentionality and definitely a trip partner. But, uh, you, I don't think that you want to enter into, the, into these journeys alone. And that trip partner has got to be present has to have the five, six, eight hours that, that you might need to have to be with them. And so it's not just a couple of hours, then I'll, I'll, I'll go home kind of thing. So those are, those are good standards. Yeah, um, I think that you brought up a great point, Andrew. And I just wanted to say that I, I do manage um, a database of, of therapists internationally who write to me and say, hey, I am open to offer integration support for anybody who has had a psychedelic experience. And, and you know, need some support. And if you know any therapist or a social worker who would like to be added to the list, please let me know. Um, also, one thing that I always let people know after a journey is that the experience continues to unfold for days and sometimes weeks. And that it, you know, it just, it comes in waves. So, okay, I'm going to take a question over here. So, I had a question um, about, uh, for the Iowa game, in that uh, after use and everything, it reduces the opioid cravings and the withdrawal symptoms, and then work be, uh, at a dope where uh, people are using maintenance, like the, kind of like afterwards, like smaller dosage of our games to reduce like cravings, like so they would like, stay absent longer and have a chance to recover. And just your thoughts on that. The thoughts on uh, post treatment uh, microdosing? Yeah, microdosing. Yeah, there's that's that's a trend right now. In fact, Jim Jim Fadiman spoke about that yesterday at, at some length. Um, I, I I don't rule it out at all. I, I think that there's been a resistance to that at some level because the whole idea about ibogaine when we first came down the pike was, hey, it's it's. I mean, you don't have to do any drugs at all. And um, so you know, like selective use of psychedelics. Um, I, w I wouldn't think. I, I mean, in microdose, I wouldn't think every day personally, but. Uh, uh, who knows? These things are. This is a very good question and a very good point for further research. I, I, I think that's the next step. Is how do we use these more practically and long term? And I want to just address one brief thing about what Andrew suggested, and uh, everyone here has really talked about, is that the criteria, and this is Maps' uh, issue as well, like the 300 therapists, for for example, the criteria for that. Uh, in my opinion, the criteria is it's, it's a challenge because I'm, I'm associating with affiliating with a clinic in Mexico now, and we're, we're, our patient load is already expanding dramatically. And so, what I'm noticing is that what, who has those criteria? Who has those um, skills, skill sets, like uh, knowledge of um, of addiction treatment, some clinical or actual clinical training? Because that's that's an, that's not bad to have. 
um, so understanding of you know um, multiple diagnoses, etc. And then um, of course uh, experience with the medicine itself, the firsthand knowledge when possible. So these things, those, those are just a few. Um, uh, obviously, identification with addiction treatment knowledge, like tr identification of triggers, support system development, that kind of thing. I always say that Ibogaine is really about the marriage of Ibogaine with addiction treatment 101. So you need both. Okay, um, we have five minutes left and I want to get some more questions in. So one, two, uh, three in the back. Let's see if we can get through three. Uh, so, better be yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> My question is centered around trying to uh, get more help for the people who need it. How do doctors know about the the benefits of these treatments, and uh, are they taught in uh, naturopathy schools, allopathy schools? I mean, what what kind of um, method are you are you able to employ to get out the word as to the benefits of these programs? Well, since they're not legal yet in the United States, um, doctors can't, can't get the word out. In fact, um, as a, a licensed professional, if you make a recommendation to a patient for an illegal treatment, you know, you put your license at risk. So it's a very, very difficult uh, area. I, I wanted to make uh, one comment, though, but um, very short about methadone. Um, and. Um, uh, and this relates to the multiple paths to uh, addiction and multiple paths to recovery. Um, the, the essence, I think, of effective treatment is that we meet our, our patient clients as unique individuals and we create a space of safety to work collaboratively to support them in finding the path that is going to be best for them so that we don't, we don't approach our folks with a doctrine that psychedelics are good for you, or methadone is bad for you, or abstinence is bad for you. I mean, that's what needs to come out of the therapeutic process, so that for some people, abstinence is a wonderful path, and for others, moderation or safe use is a wonderful path. Similarly with methadone, um, methadone is, is, a, has, is probably the most effective substance uh, at keep helping people keep stay alive who have had significant opiate um, histories. And we're also seeing that people on heroin maintenance, uh, and I've met some of them who have been on long-term heroin maintenance, are thriving in their lives. So I think we need to get out of the business of deciding what is best for you. Our job is to support and collaborate uh, in helping people discover the path that's best for them. Um, my question's for Lene. First, thank you. Um, for sharing those successes, those recent harm reduction ones with dancing. Um, I'm specifically wondering in the work that you do with the Sendo Project, how you deal with liability issues related with medical personnel on site with not being the medical team that the promoters or the organizers have contracted out and bringing in your own. And that's something that I know is a common struggle. So I was just wondering if you could shed light on it. Thank you. That's a really great question and something that I've definitely been chewing on a lot because we don't have liability insurance and it would cost about $10,000 per event per year. So we don't, we're not in a position to do that. Um, whenever I started doing this harm reduction work, the agreement that I made with myself and MAPS was that it wouldn't ever take away funding from our clinical work or slow down any of our clinical studies. So as far as liability goes, the medical professionals who volunteer in our space are putting their liability on the line, and it's up to them. And we don't provide any medical care besides first aid in the space. All that we do is triage to like Burning Man organizations, medic, and we have radios so that we can communicate with them and dispatch them. And the organizers left it. Yeah, the organizers of the festival? Yeah, they're grateful that we bought radio so that we can communicate directly with them. Okay, so um, we actually, the last questioner has 
rescinded his question. I want to take the last minute that we have to remind you to fill out your session evaluations because they are really, really helpful when we're planning this conference in two years. Yes, you have the event organizer in the room, so I'm going to remind you to fill out your evaluations and turn them into our room host right here at the back. Um, and thank you all for being such an attentive and wonderful audience. And let's thank our panelists one more time.